Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be analyzing Dimash. Now, I have been requested Dimash since I think literally day one of me even talking about voice on the internet at all. Uh, back when I started this channel on my old James Labrie video, I think when I was answering some of the questions, one of the comments I got was, have you ever heard of Dimash? And I'd never heard of him up to that point, and so... Over the past year or so, I've heard him in various places and, and heard him in different settings. And it's about time I do an analysis of him because I know that basically every other voice coach on YouTube has talked about him. And I kind of want to give you guys my perspective on some of the things that he does. Maybe give you a little bit more of a physiological perspective on, on some of this stuff. If you've never seen my content before, I differ from other vocal coaches in that my content is much more directed at strictly analyzing technique. Now, I'm going to go into this right off the bat, though, and say that Dimash is absolutely phenomenal he's an incredible talent and he does things that no one else is doing right now in terms of vocal efficiency and skill but this is not a reaction video so you're not going to see me make all the o faces and all that kind of stuff i'm strictly going to be trying to explain to you some of the technical things behind what dimash is doing so that perhaps you can implement it into your own singing or at least have a better understanding of what you're hearing so to start off here are a few characteristics of dimash's singing technique first off he has incredible vocal facility which is demonstrated by his use of a large array of vocal colors he also has excellent management of his breath when he sings. Uh, he has an extremely large functional range. Uh, he has very good tonal consistency across his range that kind of causes him to defy common voice classifications. Finally, he has excellent legato, particularly when he's using melismatic passages. So I'm going to jump right into this. This is Sinful Passion. I'm sure that most of you have heard this before, and I'm sure that most of you know exactly what this is. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I'm going to have to break the audio up. I've kind of gotten some more insight into how all this copyright stuff works. And as long as my clips aren't longer than 10 seconds, I won't get hit with a copyright strike. So I'm going to have to make this really choppy. I apologize. Hopefully all of you have heard this before. So you know what to expect in the song. If not, I'm going to link the source video in the description and in the comments. So that way you can go ahead and listen to it for yourself and see what's going on. And really quickly before we start, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps me out when you do that. So without further ado, here's Dimash Sinful Passion. Let's go. Okay, so to be honest, when I first heard this, I thought that we were going to have some issues here. And the reason I say that is because most of the time when singers use this really breathy, airy kind of sound, it's a habit in their singing. And so I didn't really know what to expect the first time I heard him sing. Typically, you want to use the breathy sound to create a certain effect, and you don't want it to be kind of a mainstay of your technique. Effectively, what you're doing when you use extra air is you're not letting the vocal folds fully close, and they're vibrating only touching in specific places. They're not fully closing and vibrating like they normally do when you're not using extra air. In many cases, if you do this all the time, it can damage your voice. And there are lots and lots of examples of this. Like John Mayer was a huge example of someone who used this breathy sound and ended up developing a vocal granuloma. But the difference between Dimash and John Mayer is that in John Mayer's case, it became the main characteristic of how he sung. And in Dimash's case, he clearly is just doing this sound to create a specific dramatic effect. And it isn't the default singing sound that he creates. So in Dimash's case, it's okay for him to do this in small amounts. Now, if he did this all the time and that was his entire singing technique, I would say, yeah, this isn't good for you. But he shows in this video and everywhere else that he's such a diverse singer in his technique that it's really not a big deal for him to do it in small amounts. So I'm not knocking him here. Don't think that I'm you know, saying anything bad about him. I'm just saying that as far as technique is concerned, you don't want to do this all the time. But if you're using it for an artistic effect, it's totally okay. One thing to really point out about just the second phrase that he's singing is that he's already taken some of that air out of the sound and you're hearing this open larynx, low larynx kind of sound. So you hear this kind of more um, 
it has this more robust, thicker kind of sound. And what that's showing is that he is controlling the size of the vocal tract. He's creating more space in the vocal tract. Whenever you hear that oh, kind of sound, what that effectively is, is the larynx lowering to create more space. And so the sound that comes out has more room in the throat to reverberate. So it creates that darker, sort of richer vocal timbre. And so he's demonstrated that he can do that here. He's going to demonstrate it more in the future in the song as well. But I just wanted to go ahead and point that out, that he's already showing his ability to use different vocal colors from what he did at the very beginning when it was all super airy, further enforcing my point that it's not just breathiness that he's sticking to. He's showing lots of different sounds he can create with his voice. So here he, you can tell by the fact that he's singing with such a soft sort of demeanor that he's doing this to set up a phrase coming later in the song. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this, but the, the most common singing technique that we utilize to create this kind of effect is mesa di voce. And mesa di voce basically means the mixture of the voice. And what I'm talking about is the ability to sing with a consistent tone at lower dynamic levels. And this is done by controlling the amount of of air that accompanies the dynamic of the sound as it comes out of your mouth. And so a lot of times when you hear singers that will sing a phrase and then repeat it and make it louder is they're demonstrating a form of mesa di voce. It's a very difficult technique to train and it's certainly not something I throw at my students you know, right off the bat. I mean, a lot of times my students don't even touch mesa di voce exercises until they've well developed their fundamental technique. So much of it is built around management of the breath that if you don't have support underneath you and you don't have a stable diaphragm and you don't have good control of how that air comes out, making dynamics based upon the airflow is going to be next to impossible. I just wanted to pause it here so that you all could kind of know what to expect so you can hear the similarities in the singing just with different dynamic levels. So check it out. <laughs> Okay, so not only is he showing that increased dynamic level on the same phrase, same melodic phrase, when he does that, ah, that kind of openness, that is a sign of having a low larynx. And as far as contemporary singers are concerned, you almost never hear them approach singing with that kind of openness. There's a big misconception about what open throat singing entails. And Ultimately, it all goes back to the space in the vocal tract. And when you hear those kinds of vowels from Demos, he's showing a very, very clear understanding of how to position his larynx to get maximum phonation, maximum resonance. The larger the vocal tract, the more space the sound has to reverberate. And the more space the sound has to reverberate, the more present and the more full it's going to sound. Now, he has a microphone assisting him as well, but that is absolutely a bel canto technique that you would be able to apply in an operatic setting with a few tweaks to kind of help yourself sing over an orchestra. But that's exactly what opera singers, bel canto singers do when they are performing in that style. So, Dimash has already shown versatility. He could fit in multiple different styles of singing already just to, upon what he's done in the first, what, 20 seconds. It's really remarkable. So here's where things get a little sticky. And I don't mean in his singing at all, but in the way that you describe his technique. At this point, what it sounds like I'm hearing is a light mix. Now, he's putting a lot of extra air through in the voice, so it's hard to tell exactly what register he's using, but it sounds like he's using the M2 register, which is, you know, the head voice slash falsetto, but he's gotten a presence on the sound to where it could be a light mix, which is a combination of your modal or M1 register and the head voice. It could be. It's hard to tell because of the airflow, but either way, he's shown here that he's moving up into a higher register and he's got the same degree of efficacy and ease over it as he does in the lower registers. Yeah, this is really remarkable because he's doing something that a lot of singers can't. He's using his mixed voice here for sure, and you can tell that it's the mixed voice because of the vocal timbre or the, the, the type of sound that his voice is creating. 
it has enough fullness to have presence, but it doesn't sound thick like a modal register or a chest voice does. But it has that light lyrical quality that it would if you were in a full head voice. A lot of singers can do that, but they have a very limited range, like five or six pitches that they can really do a mixed voice well with. In this case, he's already showing that he's at least half an octave, maybe a bit more that he's using that mixed voice in. That already is sort of an anomaly. So here's why I'm pointing all this out. A very common question I get about singers across the board is, oh, well, what is this singer's voice type? What is that singer's voice type? And sometimes it can be hard to classify and age can be a factor, that kind of deal. There's all sorts of variables that go into determining a voice type. In Dimash's case, he's doing things that are just kind of outside the norm for a typical singer of any style or genre. So in that same sense, it's hard to classify him. I would absolutely put him in the tenor category, but to define exactly what kind of tenor is almost impossible. Maybe with age, we'll be able to determine a little more clearly. For now, I would just say that he is a very versatile tenor that could fit multiple tenor roles. So you can hear here that his vowels are all very open. And I, I hate that term in some ways because it gets so overused and it tends to cause a lot of confusion because it isn't defined very clearly. As a professional voice teacher, I have learned how to determine which vowels are open and which vowels are closed. And the best way that I can explain it is that it's based upon the timbre. So for example, if I sing a scale and the vowels are closed, it's gonna sound something like this. Ah. Okay, so I'm singing the notes and the, the notes are there, but the sound is closed because of the position of my vocal tract and the position of the larynx. So listen to this. Ah those vowels are more open. They're more open because my soft palate is raised, my larynx is low, and as a result, the vowels take on a darker, more rich, robust sound. That timbre difference is what determines the difference between open and closed singing sounds and vowels. So if you listen in Dimash's case, you kind of have to listen inside of the vowels that he's singing, and you hear that there's this richness that kind of sits underneath the main sound that you hear. That is what determines if the vowels are open. And what that shows is that he's raising his soft palate, lowering his larynx, creating a lot of space in the back of the mouth. That is open throat singing. That is what creates an open vowel sound that you hear about. And he's demonstrating that about as well as any contemporary singer I've ever heard. So that is a full falsetto. Now you're going to hear all sorts of people arguing and debating about what type of sound he creates when he does that kind of thing. And he does have a whistle voice, but what he just demonstrated is not a whistle voice. That would be an example of M2 register. The reason that it's the M2 register, which would categorize it as the head voice or the falsetto, is that the sound keeps the same timbre all the way through. If he went into a whistle voice here, it would almost have this like dog whistle, super bright, fluty kind of sound. Now here, the sound quality almost has more of the tone of a soprano, like a, like a dramatic soprano or something like that. And that alludes to that register being the head voice, falsetto. That is a whistle tone. And you can tell because when he moves up that interval, up to the higher pitch, the timbre changes. The timbre changes from that, oh, that, oh, kind of sound to almost a thinner, more fluty type sound. That's a whistle voice. Now, this is a great opportunity for me to talk about whistle voice a little bit. Because you hear that term, that phrase, that terminology, that verbiage everywhere all the time. The truth about the whistle voice is that we don't really even know what causes it 100%. We have guesses, we have educated guesses, but we really don't know. The reason that we don't know is that we found that when you scope the throat to look at what the voice is doing when it creates those sounds, the mechanism is configured in a way to where we can't really see a whole lot. 
it's hard to see exactly what the vocal mechanism is physically doing when the whistle voice is created. So as a result, we only have so much data as to what is being done when the whistle voice is created. I want to let all of you know that because you're going to hear a lot of people out there talking about, oh, well, he's got this open whistle and, you know, the whistle voice is so connected and coordinated and all this stuff. The truth of it is that the whistle register is already something that is extremely rare, even in women. And for men, it's even more rare. And as such, we only have a limited sample of people who can create it. One thing I would strongly avoid is if you hear people online teaching how to use a whistle voice by doing things like inhaling while you sing, stay away from that stuff. It's extremely dangerous, and that is certainly not what Dimash is doing here. There is nothing about his singing sound that implies anything other than air coming out. So if you hear someone explain that you can create a whistle sound by taking sound in and by inhaling, it's false. It's incorrect. Even if they demonstrate it somehow, it's still not something that is healthy or sustainable for your voice, and I would highly recommend avoiding it. The truth is that the whistle register can only be trained to a certain degree. After a certain point, it's just something that someone finds and they have or they don't. Now, once they've established the ability to do it, it can be better coordinated with the rest of the voice for sure. But I certainly would not say that it's something that everyone is just able to do. I would never advertise that. I would never say that I can teach that because it's patently false. And people who claim that are lying to you. All that being said, Dimash has clearly shown that he can sing in a whistle register and it's a remarkable, phenomenal thing. I am envious. I wish I could sing like that. I wish I had that kind of a range. It's, it's something that is almost beyond description in terms of, like I said, how it's done and the technique required to create it. My biggest question mark that I have, and it's not a knock on him, it's just a, it's something I wonder is, will he be able to do this in the future? Typically we find that as men age, the range becomes a lot more narrow and sometimes lower. And again, we don't exactly know 100% why, but a very common hypothesis is that the cartilage in the larynx hardens because of testosterone. And once the voice ages in men to a certain point, the larynx is stable and hard. And since cartilage hardens as men age, the entire vocal mechanism is a little stiffer and range is ultimately determined by the elasticity of the various parts of the vocal mechanism. So if the, the larynx and the folds are more stiff, it's going to be hard for it all to stretch in the way that it needs to to create higher pitches. So I wonder how this is going to be in 10 years. If Dimash can still do it in another 10 years, he should be the subject of a case study because he is the model of the kind of individual that we could use as a way to better understand these unique kind of freakish ways of singing so that maybe one day we can develop some kind of pedagogy around singing in this style. I, I would love to see that. So this is not taking anything away from Dimash's incredible capabilities. He's a far better singer than I am. He's a remarkable talent. I just wonder how long this is going to last. I hope it lasts forever, but you know, I I'm anxious to see where this all goes in terms of his long-term career. That little recapitulation, that little uh 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 thing he does. Though what he's doing is is he's he's recapitulating onsets. Onsets are basically when you uh, start a word that begins with a vowel, like open. If I went oh, 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 oh open like that, that would be an example of what he's doing. Now he's extremely good at it. He does it very quickly. Um, in terms of classical pedagogy and classical study, that technique was used as ornamentation pretty frequently in the Baroque era. Now I know that in Eastern music and in Middle Eastern countries that singing method is used a lot more prevalently than it is in Western music. As a result, I'm not super familiar with the actual technique that they train and develop to make it happen. I do know what they're doing, but I, like I said, it's, it's onsets. It's very fast, repeated onsets, but I don't know what they do to train it specifically because it's not used so much anymore in Western music and Western vocal pedagogy. So he's using fast onsets. I don't know how, uh, but that's definitely what he's doing there for sure. Like... <laughs> 
there's so much that was ridiculous about that. I'm probably going to get a copyright strike just from playing all that at once. But like the the. <laughs> There's, how do, where do you even start? Like, I mean, I, this isn't a reaction video. I promise I've seen this before. Like, but I, like, <laughs> what he just did is freaking remarkable. There's so many things that, that go into being able to do that, that just don't make sense. It's like inhuman. One, how do you manage your breath for that long? Like he went from a, a like a very bright forward placed, head voice up into almost that pseudo whistly thing again. I don't, I don't even know what you would call that, but then he does a melisma and he carries this melisma for another, what, 10 seconds. I mean, that's probably a total of 20 seconds of singing on one breath with this huge variation in pitches. I've done some like, not to compare myself to what he's doing at all, but I'm trying to give like a point of comparison to the closest thing I've ever done to this. I performed a piece in college uh, called With Joy the Impatient Husbandman uh, for, by Haydn. And there's this really long phrase with this like these big massive melisma across like, I don't know, four or five measures. And the way I always learned to do it was conserve air, try to make there be as little air transferred out of the mouth from note to note as possible. But even that phrase that I sung was probably, I don't know, six or seven seconds. If you, if you look on YouTube, look up Zachary Ansley. It's like another channel that I had back when I was in, in college, kind of like documenting my recitals. You can hear me sing it. It was like eight years ago, but like I even struggled with that. And it, the, the thing is the range of it was only like a fourth or a fifth. This stuff goes well over an octave and it's, tonally consistent it sounds like the same singer from the start to the end i i don't even know how i would begin to teach someone to do that it it it, it defies what you would commonly think of as human limitations it, it's it's freakish i mean it's unbelievable that he held a note that long first off second off maintained the air throughout the phrase so evenly and then third had such vocal precision with all the notes and fourth sung so many freaking notes in a, in one line of melisma, all of that together is, it's just unbelievable. And I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like that before in singing. So, uh, consider me dumbfounded. I thought that I would have more intelligent, co coherent things to say about it. But now that I'm actually in the moment trying to like talk about what's going on, there are so many things that are coordinated there that just don't make sense to that. They all work that I, I don't know how he does it. I mean, it's incredible. It, it's really, really, really incredible. And that's it. I mean, what do you say about that? I mean, there there are some things you see in your life that just sort of defy description or, or teaching or any of that kind of stuff. And and that that is one of the most incredible vocal feats I've ever heard in my life. And uh, so it, there's just not a lot you can say other than wow. And uh I'm beyond impressed by this guy. I wouldn't say that I'm envious because I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not a jealous kind of person, but I would love to be able to sing like that. And uh, what the amount of talent and the amount of training and the amount of work he's done to be able to produce what he does as a singer, absolutely remarkable, worthy of every praise and accolade that he gets. To be honest, when I first heard Dimash, I, I was really skeptical because he was so heavily praised. You know, I, I thought that he was just going to be like, oh, another pop singer kind of thing. But after listening to him a good bit, I, I really understood that this man is a transcendent, exceptional talent that the world doesn't see much of. So I hope you all enjoyed this analysis. I hope that it was informative and I hope that it maybe shed some light on some of these things that are confusing and uh, I hope that it helped you to better appreciate even more how incredibly talented this individual is. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe if you like my content. There's a ton of it on this channel of me analyzing all sorts of singers in this fashion. Uh, I do have a Patreon if you are wanting to support me in my efforts. I also teach voice lessons, and I'm a professional teacher in Atlanta. I didn't make that clear at the beginning of the video, but I do teach at a music studio in Atlanta, uh, and I do teach privately at home as well. So if you are interested in voice lessons, I have a link to my website 
in the description. I also have a Discord server. If you want to join in and have some really great vocal discussions, please feel free to join. You also see all my socials here, so please feel free to follow me in any of those that you like. And I will see you all again next week with another analysis. Take care. Thanks. Bye.